Example 2 of Circuit Board Layout for Electromagnetic Compatibility is brought to you by Learn EMC. In this example, we'll take a look at improving the EMC performance of a printed circuit board through some simple modifications to the layout. First, we'll take a quick look at the relevant features of the original design. Next, we'll identify some specific issues of interest that may impact the EMC performance of the board and we'll determine the best way to address each one. And finally, we'll present a new layout that incorporates all of the suggested changes. The original design for this printed circuit board specifies that it is a daughter card that connects directly to a computer motherboard inside a metal enclosure. The board is designed to amplify and modify an analog audio input from an electric guitar. The modified signal is used to drive an external speaker. The board has two digital interfaces, one to the motherboard and the other to an external connector. Notice that most of the digital interconnections on the board are not shown. We did this for clarity so that we can more easily focus on certain parts of the design. We'll assume that the locations of the four external connectors on this board cannot be changed. Here's the layer stack up for the board. There are six equally spaced layers with ground on the third layer and power on the fourth layer. The layers are a quarter millimeter apart, and since the spacing is less than half a millimeter, the power and ground planes are considered closely spaced. The cable shields on the three cables connect to the ground plane and also to the metal enclosure. The active digital components on the board are clocked at 32 megahertz, and the analog electric guitar input is in the range of about 50 hertz to 10 kilohertz. Notice that there's one active component in the upper right corner that has both analog and digital pins. This is a mixed signal board since both analog and digital signals are present. The black dots on the board indicate connections to the power plane and the open dots are connections to the ground plane. The board has six global decoupling capacitors that are connected directly between the power and ground planes through vias with no traces. Here's the design of the power and ground planes for the board. The power plane, shown by the red fill, extends over the whole board except for the area below the analog traces. The ground plane also extends over the whole board, but a gap in the ground plane isolates the area under the analog traces from the digital part of the board. Notice that the gap does not extend all the way to the edge of the board at the upper right, so the analog and digital sections of the ground fill are joined at this point. Here's a summary of the original design for this board. We have a daughter card connecting to a motherboard inside a metal enclosure. The cable shields for the three cables connect to the metal enclosure and to the ground plane. This is a six layer board with closely spaced power and ground planes. The decoupling on this board is global with six decoupling capacitors. The ground plane is gapped to isolate the analog section of the board from the digital section and the power plane does not extend under the section of the board with analog traces. The designers of this board did many things right with respect to EMC performance but we're going to find that there are several simple layout changes that will increase the likelihood that this board will meet EMC requirements. Based on the design of this particular board, here are some specific issues we'll consider. For each issue, we want to determine if EMC performance or signal integrity will benefit by changes to the layout. We'll look at the design of the ground plane, in particular the gap in the ground plane. We'll examine the location of the high-speed circuitry relative to external connectors. We'll check the current return paths of the low-frequency analog signals. We'll look at the routing of the clock traces. And we'll make sure that there's adequate decoupling on the board. Printed circuit boards can fail EMC requirements for many different reasons, and all it takes is one significant layout issue to cause a product to fail. Now this board is pretty well designed to begin with, but if we want to try to maximize the likelihood of meeting EMC requirements, it's worth taking a close look at each of these issues. Let's start with the design of the ground plane. 
The gap in the ground plane is intended to improve analog signal integrity by isolating the analog return currents from the digital return currents. However, a gap separating external connectors may lead to a small potential difference between the connectors. As little as one millivolt of potential driving one cable shield relative to another can result in radiated emissions above the FCC limit. To prevent this, boards with high-speed digital signals must have all their cables referenced to the same ground. This means there should never be a gap in a ground plane between connectors. In fact, the best rule of thumb is to never gap a solid ground plane under any circumstances. We'll remove the gap in the ground plane on this board. We'll address the issue of the current return paths for the analog signals in a minute, but first let's take a look at the location of the high-speed circuitry relative to the external connectors on the board. In example one of this series, we were able to move the external connectors on the board so that there was no high-speed circuitry between the connectors. We did this to avoid small potential differences between connectors that can lead to one cable or structure driving another like a dipole antenna. For this example, however, our design specifies that we cannot change the locations of the external connectors. Notice that the low-speed circuitry is located in the upper right part of the board near the two low-frequency analog connectors. The two digital interfaces are located close to one another in the lower right corner of the board. The digital circuitry must connect to these two connectors, but the fact that they're close together helps limit the amplitude of any potential difference that might develop. In the new layout, we'll keep the analog circuitry near the analog I.O. connectors and the digital circuitry near the digital connectors. And that's about the best we can do, given that we can't change the locations of the external connectors. If this board had been surrounded by a plastic enclosure instead of metal, the product would probably have difficulty meeting an emissions requirement. Since the enclosure is metal, we'll rely on the enclosure to short out the potential difference between connectors. Now, even though we're relying on the metal enclosure for this particular radiation mechanism, we'll still want to try to minimize radiation for other mechanisms in order to have the best chance of complying with EMC requirements. Next, let's take a look at the analog signal current return paths to determine whether sharing the ground plane with the digital signals is a problem. Since we're not going to gap the ground plane to isolate the analog signal current return paths, we need to determine whether some other method of protecting these signals is needed. On this board, there are two analog signals to consider. The amplified speaker outputs are differential and isolated from the ground plane, so they're unlikely to be affected by low frequency currents flowing on the ground plane. This means the only analog signal that we need to be concerned with is the electric guitar input. This relatively weak signal current enters the board through the center conductor of the coaxial connector and travels to the input pin of the amplifier. The return current for this signal is dumped onto the ground plane at the analog ground pin of the amplifier and finds its way back to the shield of the coaxial connector. Allowing this low amplitude, low frequency signal to share the ground plane with the digital signals makes it possible for noise to degrade the signal through common impedance coupling. A common way to address this issue is to provide a dedicated return path in the form of a trace with a single point connection to ground. The reason for specifying a single point connection to ground is that if both ends of the trace are connected to the ground plane, some of the digital signal return current on the ground plane would travel along the trace. Also, with both ends connected to ground, some portion of the analog return current would travel on the ground plane rather than on the trace. So a two point connection to ground would essentially defeat the purpose of providing a dedicated trace for the analog return current. For this board, our options are limited by the coaxial connector. The return current flows on the coaxial cable shield, and the shield is connected to the ground plane. The analog ground pin of the amplifier is also connected to ground, so the only way to provide a dedicated trace with a single point connection to ground is to disconnect from ground at one end or the other. 
It's not really possible to isolate the ground pin of the amplifier from ground, since there's a connection between analog and digital ground inside the chip, even if the analog ground pin is floated. But isolating the coaxial cable shield from ground is likely to produce excessive radiated emissions. This means that for this example, we will not be able to provide the return current of the electric guitar input with a dedicated trace with a single point connection to ground. Since electric guitar audio is not as sensitive to small levels of noise as some other audio signals, the best compromise in this case is to minimize the distance between the amplifier and the connector and allow this return current to use the ground plane. Keep in mind, however, that if we had an analog input signal that was more sensitive to noise, we would not want to allow the return current to flow on the ground plane. Let's take a quick look at an example. If the audio input on this board was from a microphone instead of an electric guitar, we would not want the return current for the microphone input to travel on the ground plane, since it could easily be degraded by common impedance coupling. Also, we would not want to use a coaxial cable and connector with the microphone input, since there's no good solution for handling the return current. A microphone signal should be conveyed differentially on a pair of wires isolated from ground. This would require an amplifier with a differential input, as shown in the diagram. But in our case, the electric guitar input is not as sensitive to noise, so we'll just shorten the distance and allow the return current to travel on the ground plane. The analog traces can be routed on layers 1 and 2, so that the ground plane effectively isolates them from noise on the power plane. This means the power plane can be filled in below the analog section of the board, Although there's no particular advantage to filling in the power plane, other than a slight increase in the capacitance between the power and ground planes. Concerning the routing of the clock traces on this board, notice that the 32 MHz clock traces are longer than necessary. Long traces carrying high frequency signals are more likely than short traces to couple energy to other structures. Because the clock traces carry the highest frequency signals on the board, it's a good idea to minimize their length. Also notice that one of the clock traces runs very close to the top edge of the board. Routing a high-speed trace close to the edge of a board is usually a bad idea, since it can easily couple energy to external cables and other structures. On the new layout, we'll shift components and reroute the clock traces to reduce their length and keep them away from the edges of the board. Now let's take a close look at the decoupling on this board to make sure it's adequate. Recall that the power and ground planes are on closely spaced adjacent layers, so all of the decoupling is global. This means we don't need to worry about placing the capacitors very close to active devices. We can just scatter them around the board. The existing decoupling capacitors are scattered around the board, and they're connected directly to the planes using vias in the pads, just as they should be. Notice that the vias are located very close together on one side of each capacitor, which is optimum for global decoupling. So the decoupling on this board is done exactly right with just one exception. There are not quite enough decoupling capacitors for the board. One capacitor per active device is generally not sufficient on high-speed boards where the active devices may have multiple power pins. We'll add more global decoupling capacitors in the new layout. Now that we've explored each of these issues and decided on several simple changes to improve the EMC performance of the board, we're ready to see the new layout. Here's the original layout and the new layout side by side. The components have been rearranged to allow the 32 MHz clock to be distributed more efficiently, as shown by the blue traces. None of the clock distribution traces runs near a board edge, and the distance from the clock driver to the most distant device has been significantly reduced. This allowed us to shorten the clock traces considerably. Concerning the unamplified electric guitar input, we decided to allow the return current to travel on the ground plane but we reduced the distance it had to travel in order to reduce the exposure to common impedance coupling on the ground plane. 
This should work in this case since electric guitar audio is not as sensitive to small levels of noise as other audio signals. But with a more sensitive signal, we'd have to come up with a different solution. We added additional decoupling capacitors to the board. Note that the rearrangement of the components left an empty region on the left side of the board. The power and ground planes could have been removed from that area, but we've chosen to leave these areas filled in order to maximize the capacitance between power and ground planes. We placed some decoupling capacitors in this empty region. Here's the new design for the power and ground planes. We removed the gap in the ground plane, and in terms of improving EMC performance, this may be the single most important change we've made. A gap in the ground plane can lead to potential differences that can cause significant unintended radiation. By removing the gap, we made this type of radiation much less likely. We also filled in the power plane beneath the analog section, since without the gap in the ground plane, there was no longer a need to leave this area unfilled. This new layout is significantly more robust than the original board with respect to EMC and signal integrity. We stated earlier that the original board was fairly well designed in the first place, and there's a possibility that EMC problems would not have arisen. But with the simple changes we've made, the new layout is now significantly more likely to meet EMC requirements. For more information, take a look at the articles PCB layout, circuit board decoupling, and identifying current paths. These tutorials are available on the Learn EMC website.